And so again, good morning. So I'm Ryan Kawamoto. I'm Regional Director for Older Adults Technology Services. And I'd like to welcome you to a very special event today as part of National Digital Inclusion Week, which just started yesterday. I'd also like to thank AARP California for their generous support and sponsorship of today's Senior Plan at Avenida's event. And we actually have two very short introductory, introductory videos on behalf of AARP uh, to welcome all of you today. So I'd actually like to uh, share my screen and play that now. I'm Joanne Jenkins with AARP. In these challenging times, we need each other more than ever. We may be apart, but we're not alone. Use AARP Community Connections to find or create a mutual aid group near you. Stay connected and help those in need. Hi everybody, I'm Sophie Horiuchi Forrester, Regional Manager for AARP California in San Jose. And welcome to National Digital Inclusion Week. High-speed internet and digital literacy is no longer a luxury in our society. It's an essential part of how we live, how we stay connected, and how we age successfully. Everyone should have access to fast, reliable, affordable high-speed internet, and all communities should have the opportunity to thrive in this ever-changing digital world. Digital literacy is another part of the equation, equipping people of all ages with the skills to benefit from technologies that improve quality of life and successful aging. It's so important to know how to navigate these new online frontiers safely. And we're delighted today to be a sponsor and to work with Senior Planet to bring today's program to you. To learn more about AARP, visit our website at aarp.org. On that note, um, just wanted to mention a couple logistics. Um, so Susan will be presenting, but um, if you have any questions, please feel free to write them in the chat as we will have a question and answer session after Susan has presented. And we'll do our best to make sure your questions get answered. So to officially begin our presentation, I'd like to introduce Richard Adler as today's event facilitator, who is an Institute for the Future Distinguished Fellow, the Chair of Age Friendly's Cupertino Task Force, and a Santa Clara Senior Care County Commissioner. He was instrumental in developing the partnership between Avenidas and Older Adults Technology Services to create Senior Planet at Avenidas, and is considered one of the foremost experts on the intersection between older adults and technology. Thank you so much, Richard. Thank you, Ryan, and uh, welcome to everybody. Nice to be here, nice to be with you all. Uh, my job today is to introduce my colleague and friend, Susan Nash, who is going to be our presenter for the day. Susan is uh, an Encore Fellow in the city of San Jose's mayor office, where she has been responsible for managing that city's age-friendly program. She's also a visiting scholar at the San, uh, Stanford Center on Longevity. Uh, in San Jose, she's been working very hard on an age-friendly master plan for the city. And she is going to be actually announcing that this week on Thursday. Uh, she is also one of the leading experts on fake news and how the dissemination of disinformation uh, affects older adults. Uh, and she's written about this extensively and has been quoted in the national press. Uh, she's also been working with me and a group of others on uh, a new initiative to promote digital inclusion in, in Santa Clara County. So I am looking forward to hearing her. Uh, Susan received a JD from the Stanford Law School and has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. So uh, at this point, I'd like to welcome Susan and turn the platform to her. Thank you, Richard. Oh, Great to maybe, let me just say, let me just also say, uh, we're going to leave some time at the end for questions from, from the audience. So if you have a question, Ryan, is the best way for them is to put it in the chat function yes. down at the bottom. You, will, you know, there's a chat function and just, just uh, put your questions in there, and when Susan is finished, uh, I'll ask some of those questions. Susan. Okay, great. Well, thanks, everybody, and uh, to uh, to those of you out there who I don't know, thanks for coming to this. Uh, as Richard mentioned, in one of the hats I wear is uh, at the Stanford Center on Longevity, and for the past few years, I've been looking at this specific question of how we can help 
older adults be better online consumers of information. I say that having just celebrated my 64th birthday, I am passionately interested and concerned about how we tell fact from fiction online. So um, thanks for coming to this event today and let's just dive right in. So I thought I'd give you just a brief overview of what I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, and the first part will be uh, some of the history of fake news. I know sometimes these issues sound like they're new, but I think if we just look back a few years or a few hundred years, you'll, uh, you'll agree with me that we, we already know something about disinformation and misinformation. Then I'm going to give you some definitions because fake news, of course, is a term that is bandied about all the time now. Um, I'm, I'm kind of wishing I could come up with a different term, um, it, but uh, let's have some definitions of what, uh, what we mean when we say it. Then I'll talk a little bit about who falls for fake news, at least what the studies are showing and why. And you'll see, I think, why this topic of older people in particular going online uh, has become one of particular interest um, and is getting, the, getting some attention today and in other parts of the country. And then I'll spend some time on how you can be your own fact checker, uh, beginning with the way the professional fact checkers do it and ending with some sort of cheat sheet kind of tips that hopefully you will find useful as you um, navigate uh, the months to come and, and uh, just your daily uh, con con consumption of, of news online. So to start with the history, uh, Mark Twain is famously quoted as saying that it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. That's just a, a Mark Twain kind of way of saying that bad information, false information has both been around for a long time and people have been falling for it long, for a long time. Mark Twain said this sometime in the 19th century, supposedly, but most people would argue that, at least I would argue, that fake news probably started with the first printing press. Uh, as soon as people could disseminate information broadly, uh, some of that information turned out to be not true. It made its way early on to the new country when our second president was presented with the concept of freedom of the press. He is, said, he is said to have reported that there, that would just lead to more error. Uh, there'd been more error propagated by the press in his experience of the last 10 years than in the 100 years before. All of which is to say that uh, this problem began with the printed word. It started in America hundreds of years ago. So why are we still talking about it today? Well, I don't think I have to tell anybody here, but Fake news sells newspapers. Back in the day, uh, there, it's always been something that people are titillated by. And in 1835, for example, a well-known paper in New York published six weeks of a series supposedly depicting life on Mars mm -hmm. and reporting on the work of a then famous astronomer. The whole thing turned out to be a hoax, but for a long time, this paper was selling uh, like hotcakes off the, off the um, off the newspaper stands. So fake news sells and people are interested in stories and whether they're true or not sometimes doesn't matter. So why are we here talking about it today? Well, the context has changed and I thought I would just put some numbers up to give you an idea of how much more broadly and more quickly uh, a story can spread. Facebook is estimated to have almost two and a half billion monthly users. Twitter, almost 330 million users every month. YouTube, two billion monthly users. And this is the statistic that always gets me when, when I say it. The, the conservative estimate is that 300 hours of video are uploaded to YouTube every single minute. So just the amount of news and the ability for it to spread quickly have increased uh, geometrically at a level that nobody could have anticipated. So if you have, a, uh, if you have a story that gets out there, it's very hard to dial it back. And at that point we need, once these fake stories are out there, we need people to be digitally literate and able to understand for themselves whether what they are seeing is true or not. 
So I noticed in the um, description of this program today that, that uh, Ryan had promised that I would define digital literacy. And uh, I put this slide in for Ryan. Um, there's, a, there's an American Library Association definition that's got a lot of words in it. It defines digital literacy as the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create, communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. That, that I think is a perfectly fine definition. Here's what I think about it. I think if you're going to be digitally literate, you need to be able to do three things online. First, you need to be able to use the technology you get to the sites that you want to get to, look at your Facebook feed if that's what you want to do, the nuts and bolts. Second, and this is what we're talking about today, you need to be able to understand and evaluate what you see once you get there. It's not just like taking the driving test, the written part of the right driving test, right? You need to, as Professor Sam Weinberg is fond of saying at Stanford, you need to be able to, uh, you need to take that driver's training test and get out on the road and be able to understand what you are seeing when you're online. And third, and this is a completely separate topic that I know AARP does a great job of, of covering. To be digitally literate, you need to be able to protect your privacy and your personal information when you're online. So there's the digital literacy definition. Let's talk about what we mean when we say fake news. I wish I could do a show of hands because I'm betting that at least some people in the audience today remember this show. It was my favorite show uh, and I was crushed when it was taken off the air. But this is, a, a, this is an obvious kind of fake news, parody and satire. Most of us knew when we were watching Jon Stewart not to believe everything or maybe anything that he said uh, when he was doing his nightly show. But that's not the kind of thing we're concerned about, right? We were in on a joke. We knew that that was not something we should believe and it was all good fun, uh, even if it came across as a news show. Another kind of fake news that is not problematic, uh, but is with us all the time, is what I would call, what the legal definition it would be puffery or just a form of advertising. And what I mean by that is, if you see a McDonald's advertisement and it tells you that your big, your quarter pounder is going to look like this burger on the right half of the screen, you know that's probably not the case. You think you know that it's probably going to look a little more like the one on the left on a good day. So again, this is not an accurate representation, but it's a form of advertising that we're used to. We're in on it. We understand where this comes from, and we know not to actually believe it. These are not problems. These are just the kind of thing that we've been living with for a long time. When we get into trouble, and where things get much more difficult uh, is when we're dealing with the kind of the kinds of images and news that have been manipulated. And I'm going to take the images part first. I'm sure most of you will remember the Parkland, Florida shooting. Uh, and back in February of 2018, this uh, is a picture of Emma Gonzalez in the middle and three other um, young women who survived that shooting doing a, uh, a cover shot for Teen Vogue. And you can see that they're holding up a target practice. It's a bullseye. It's meant, to be, uh, it's meant to be a statement against gun violence. And that's what the cover looked like originally. But uh, shortly after it came out, the image was manipulated so that it looked like these young women were tearing up the US constitution. Uh, so it was, deliberately falsified to make a political point. And that's the kind of one aspect of the kind of fake information that we're dealing with today. Another kind of course, uh, and another definition of, uh, that is used in the scholarly world these days is that fake news is, consists of news articles that are intentionally and verifiably false. And one of the first ones to go viral that people may remember was this story that Pope Francis had supposedly uh, endorsed um, Donald Trump. That is, uh, that is a blatant e example of uh, an intentionally deceptive story. You'll also hear terms like disinformation and misinformation, which is not so intentional, but still misleading. 
I just wanted to give you some examples of the different ways the term is used and the different ways of thinking about it. And of course, this discussion would not be complete without noting that these days, even the term fake news can be misleading. It sometimes means, um, for some people, it just means fake news is news that they don't like. Uh, and uh, that is what much of the terminology refers to today. When I started giving these talks, I used to say uh, the fake news is not just political. I still say that today. And I would use health, health news as a kind of apolitical way of talking about it. Uh, but times have changed and now everything is political. So it's still worth pointing out that uh, fake news can come from in all sorts of different areas. And one of the major, major problems now, of course, is news about health and particularly about COVID-19. The, uh, the director general of the World Health Organization has referred not only to a pandemic, but an infodemic. There is so much bad information out there about COVID-19. This is just one example. This was a Facebook post, and it suggested that if you boiled orange peels with cayenne pepper, stood over a pot, breathed in the steam, that would uh, help you uh, avoid getting uh, COVID-19. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how you might debunk this um, when we get to the, the tips, but I just wanted to point out what I'm sure you all know, which is that, that uh, the amount of fake health news is, if anything, overtaking the, um, the straight political stuff that is out there now. So why, why is this something that Senior Planet and AARP are, are putting on today? And why is this something that I'm interested in at Stanford Center on Longevity? Well, uh, in the study of who consumed uh, fake news, meaning who visited fake news sites and who sent out uh, forwarded uh, wrong information of, during the last election, uh, a group of researchers at Princeton and NYU concluded that people over 65 shared the most fake news of any age group. And that finding was consistent across ideology, across uh, party line, across education, across economic group. It was the um, most robust finding in the study, even when holding all those other uh, factors constant. So that was a that was a wake up call uh, for many of us. That uh, this it took a, a while to shake out the election results from 2016. And you'll see here the date of this study being published is January of 2019. But it was a sobering uh, finding. And we'll talk a little bit more about why uh, in just a minute. But what, um, what the, the study did not do was um, explain the basis for the finding. I, they showed the data for the finding, but it didn't explain because this really is an area that gets us into psychology and uh, all other sorts of fields, why older people in particular were engaging with fake news in that last election. So I'm not going to give you the answer. Uh, I don't think anyone can give you the definitive answer. I'm going to give you some theories uh, and ideas to think about as you think about your own motivations when you're looking at the news. First, um, news online is targeted, particularly when you're get it, getting it through a social media platform. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you will find, or if you're on new YouTube, you will find that if you're looking at a particular news feed, you'll get suggestions of other articles you might want to look at. And the way the platforms are designed is to keep you engaged because the longer your eyeballs are on the page, the more ads you'll see uh, and uh, the more uh, information you may be providing online. It's just a, a business model that is unchanged despite all of the discussions about this issue. And so the longer you are engaged online, uh, the better the platforms do and the algorithms are designed to send you information that might appeal to you and keep you clicking. Another theory that's out there that I do think has some, some merit to it is, is something called confirmation bias, which is it's just the idea that when we see a piece of news that pretty much aligns with what we think anyway, we're more inclined to believe it. That's something that almost everybody suffers. It's not, it's not a bad thing. It's just true that as we 
As we look at something, it makes sense to us if we've already believed it. And if we've never heard it before, we may be more skeptical. Well, there's some studies showing that confirmation bias increases as we get older. And I have to say that I've become more and more sure of what I think the older I get. And I think that's something we're all susceptible to. Another theory that's out there that, again, has some support in the psychology world, and again, I'm not a psychologist, but I'm interested in what people are saying and trying to figure out this phenomenon, is that as old people get older, they, um, they may be less likely to remember exactly where they, where they heard something. And so there have been studies done with a piece of misinformation, fake news, where uh, it will be shown to a group of people, and later they'll be shown a rebuttal or a, a withdrawal of that piece of information saying that it was false. And then yet yeah, later, this is done over a series of weeks, they'll be shown this piece of information, inaccurate information again. And by that point, you'll get, um, you can get what people, what Stephen Colbert has called a feeling of truthiness about the information. It's this idea of, yeah, yeah, I've heard that a couple times now. And you might forget uh, that one of the ways you heard it was in the context of it being wrong. That's source memory, and there's some support for the idea that uh, as we get older, our source memory is not as sharp as it once was. I have to say that I think one of the really best explanations, though, for why, um, why those of us who are older have a, a little trouble online is that the social media cues are just not as obvious. We grew up in a different time. And when we went to the market and saw the National Enquirer sitting by the soup, by the checkout stand, we'd pull it out, but we knew it was the National Enquirer. We weren't gonna buy it either. We were just gonna read the, the, uh, the sketchy headlines and see what titillating stuff might be out there. But we, again, were in on the joke, so to speak. We knew what the cues were and we knew what to believe and not. That is not as true for those of us who did not uh, grow up with social media. So I think there's a lot to be said for the idea that we just are not as tuned in to cues online as to what might be true and what might not be. One thing that is proven uh, is that I've pointed out some of the issues with older people, but it is also true that we have life experience, we have wisdom, we're better able to regulate our emotions and all of those kinds of traits are defenses against misinformation. And it's something when you hear makes me a little annoyed when I read some of these studies and they say things like, well, older people have cognitive decline. It's, you know, well, you know maybe, um, maybe in some cases, maybe in some areas, but it, there's a lot of offsets to that. So I think, I think as a group, we can all, we can all bring our life experience to bear and, um, and get better at uh, consuming information. The other thing I wanted to point out uh, is that there's been a bunch of studies uh, in the last few years of disinformation and inaccurate information, fake news, I guess I'll just call it. Uh, and uh, one of them, a couple of them have come, come out of the Stanford History Education Group. Um, again, I've mentioned uh, Professor Sam Weinberg. He and his team um, did a study in 2016 of middle, high school, and college students. They concluded that over 80% of middle school students couldn't tell the difference between a news story and a sponsored content story, a sort of fake ad. A later study that the Stanford group did found that 96% of high school students could not figure out that ties to the fossil fuel industry might affect the credibility of a website about climate change. And half of that group um, saw a grainy video on Facebook that looked like it was ballot stuffing that had actually been shot in Russia uh, and again, we're unable to tell um, the origin of the video or, or make the, reach the conclusion that it was not true. So there's a lot of work to be done in all ages. I'm gonna show you an, an even more recent study in a second, but the difference I wanna point out here between the problems young people are experiencing and the problems older people are experiencing is that there are millions of dollars being devoted right now to uh, changing curriculum, uh, to, teaching younger people and teaching their teachers how to navigate online, there is much less work being done to educate older people, which is why, again, I'm so thrilled to work with Senior Planet and AARP. I'll tell you about another group towards the end of the talk, the issue's finally getting some attention, but nowhere near the amount of um, money and time and attention being devoted to educating students. 
And this study just came out um, a couple of weeks ago uh, of, of um, misinformation. This was a, a study where uh, the researchers showed 11 false stories about COVID-19 and found that the highest levels of beliefs in all of these false claims uh, were among those under 45. And that the older the age group, the lower the average level of belief in false claims, which again suggests to me that, that older people can bring their common sense, their life experience to bear. And in this particular study, uh, they actually did better than people who were younger. Uh, I think, and again, it just suggests that the conclusion is it's complicated out there and we all need help spotting fake news. And finally, just to, um, to address another question that, uh, that Ryan had put in the outline, why does digital literacy for older adults matter in particular? And here, I just wanna show you two graphs. This first one, oops, uh, is the first one on the left is a graph of voter turnout. And this green line up at the top is people over 65. And it begins in 1964 and runs through 2016. This black, black line down here are voters ages 18 to 24. So older people vote and they have consistently voted in high numbers. It doesn't take much to make the connection between consuming bad information online and voting. That's not a good combination. The other graph I wanted to show you to answer this question is the graph on hospitalization of COVID patients. And if you think about the amount of disinformation and fake news out there about COVID-19 and look at this graph showing that your likelihood of being hospitalized is much greater as you get into the 65 to 74, 74 to 84, 75 to 84 and 85 plus years of age. These are the people who, as we know, have the most serious outcomes. So we need to be good consumers of online information. And what can we do? Well, the, uh, the number one recommendation that came out of the Stanford History Education Group for young people, which applies equally, I think, to older people, to avoid getting fake, duped by fake news, think like a fact checker. So what does that mean? I'm gonna walk you through part of that Stanford study and you can see the difference between what the students did and what the professional fact checkers did. In the study, uh, students and the professional fact checkers were asked to look at a proposal to increase minimum wage. And they were given some sites to do the research on and asked to evaluate the credibility of what they found online. So here's one of the sites. It's the Employment Policies Institute. You see that up here on the left. It says businesses are closing because of the fight for $15. See the real victims of higher minimum wage laws. So this is a site that is arguing that hiking the minimum wage would be a bad thing because vic uh, businesses would be the victims. And the question posed to the students and the professional fact checkers was, is this reliable? How do you figure out if this thing you're just looking at is something to rely on in forming your opinion? So a number of the uh, students uh, went up to the top of the page here to this about us tab. I hope everybody can see that. And, and you'll, you're probably all familiar with that. There's a lot of websites of organizations and they have about us tabs and it's a way to read more about who these people are. <clears throat> so if you click on the about us tab, you find that the Employment Policies Institute is a nonprofit research organization dedicated to studying public policy issues surrounding employment growth. And if you go down here to the last sentence, you'll see <clears throat> that EPI sponsors nonpartisan research, which is conducted by independent economists at major universities around the country. So that sounds pretty good, right? Makes sense. Of course, and that's what the majority of students concluded. And they um, reported that this website was trustworthy. Of course, if you can write a web page, put up a web page uh, with disinformation on it, you can also put up an about us web page that isn't right, right? I mean, if you think about it, that's not, uh, the, the professional fact checkers did not go to the about us section of the website. What they did was leave the website and look it up themselves on Google. So they went to Google, they typed in Employment Policies Institute, all in quotes so that they would 
get results that only had all three words. And uh, when they did that, they got a page of Google results. You'll see a long list of results and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those results in just a second. But you have some options here. Uh, you can pick which one you wanna check out by reading these, uh, these uh, couple of sentences. Let's say you decide to look at the New York Times report that mentions EPI. You would find that the Employment Policies Institute is run by a public relations firm that it, uh, I didn't put all the words up on the slide, but you would find that it uh, represents the restaurant industry and it's part of a tightly coordinated effort to defeat the minimum wage increase. It's a PR firm helping the restaurant industry defeat this proposal. I will tell you that that information is not anywhere on the EPI site itself. And that's what professional fact checkers did to determine that the site couldn't be trusted. So another outcome of that study was that people needed to be aware of what kinds of results they might get when doing a Google search. And that's when I said I wanted to mention this again. Google is just a search engine. It's not giving you results in order of reliability. It's giving you results depending on all sorts of factors, one of them being whether or not a particular company or entity has paid to be listed at the top. And to make a really simple example of how Google results might be uh, something you wanna look at carefully and not take the top one. Oh, I don't seem to have that slide. Um, if, you do a, uh, if you do a search, for example, of blue running shoes, best, best running shoes, you will get a site that will um, you will get a series of results that include Nike and Allbirds and all of which are ads. And you have to scroll down farther to get, uh, to, get your, um, to, get, to get to the results that might actually give you some way to evaluate what you're finding. So what if you don't want to worry about your Google, Google results or you don't wanna be a professional fact checker and go through the steps I've shown you? What can you do? What are the shortcuts? Well, if you wanted to find out whether the Pope had really endorsed Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, you could just go to a fact-checking site. One of the good results of all of this um, uh, concern about fake news over the last several years has been the uh, creation of, of sites that will look at the rumors that are out there and try to give you the full backstory. So for example, if you go to a site called factcheck.org, you can look, search for whether the Pope endorsed Trump and you can get an answer. Did Pope Francis endorse Donald Trump? No, he is not. And again, I didn't put the whole site up here, but it will take you through the analysis of how the story got started and why it can't be believed. And one of the questions I always get is, how do we know if the fact-checking site is reliable? And that's a very good question. I will tell you that the ones I'm gonna show you um, have been uh, themselves checked and double-checked. Uh, uh, I'll be interested if Richard has any thoughts on this. I personally am not aware of any phony fact-checking sites that are springing up, um, but I, and they're probably out there. I'm trying to give you just the list of reliable ones. <clears throat> that you can go to as a kind of shortcut. If you hear a rumor, if your crazy uncle or crazy niece uh, sends you a story and you think, I'm just not sure if that's true, you can go to one of these sites, search for the story and get a quick answer. And not surprisingly, the Pope also did not endorse Hillary Clinton. This is a site called Snopes. And again, you would, um, you would look at the site, you'd get a false rating, and then you'd get a, a couple of pages of how they got to that result. So to go back to the health news for a little bit, I wanted to show you that you can also do fact checks of health rumors. And remember I showed you the Facebook post about breathing in the steam from the orange peels and water. Another great site for fact checking is PolitiFact run by the Pointer Institute. And again, they were out ahead of this. 
this stuff. Often these fact-checking sites, although it's hard to keep up these days, will have the rumors that you're seeing online and you can just search and not go through the fact-check process yourself. Another uh, option, if you uh, just hear a particular form particular of health news, is to go uh, to a trusted source. So what's a trusted source these days? Well, the World Health Organization has gotten very concerned about this infodemic, as I mentioned, and has started its own site called Mythbusters. Um, here's an example. There was a story that came out pretty early in the pandemic that, uh, that if you held your breath, if you could hold your breath for 10 seconds without coughing or feeling discomfort, you were free from the virus. This was attributed to Stanford Medicine. It got so much attention and went so, so viral that Stanford had to issue a retraction. And here it is on the Mythbusters page of the WHO. And in fact, if you were to do a Google search of some of these um, COVID rumors, such as antibiotics cure COVID, your top result, uh, I was glad to see, your top result will often be the Mythbusters page of the World Health Organization. So all of that involves a little work on your part, um, whether you do the research on the site as the fact checkers did, whether you go to a fact checking site or whether you go to a, a trusted uh, source. But those are some of the ways that you can find out for yourself whether what you're looking at is something that you can rely on. I thought I would just get away from politics for a minute and health. Uh, and show you again, this is the Snopes site I mentioned as a fact checking site. There is a lot of garbage out there on the internet. And one post that went viral was the idea that Norway had legalized marriage between humans and animals. Again, you go to Snopes, you can get, you get the rating of the story and then you can go to the about section and read how they reached this conclusion. Um, one of the things that um, if people are interested, we could put up some of these fact checking sites, uh, maybe in the chat uh, at the uh, at the end. A new fact checking site that uh, that I think is really quite cool is one called Metafact. And this is a scientifically based site where um, suppose you can't find your question answer the answer to your question online, you can ask it uh, and you will get uh, they will the site uh, is seeks answers from scientists and medical specialists and will give you what they say about your question, what their response is to your question. So for example, if you wanted to find out if gluten was unhealthy, uh, let's assume that we lived in a world where you could have a dinner party and you wanted to see if anybody could eat gluten, uh, you, would, uh, you could ask this question and 94% of the experts would say that gluten itself is not unhealthy. Uh, and you could get an answer that way. So again, these are just different options that are available. When you hear something that you're, you get a spidey sense that maybe it's not right, or uh, you're, just, you're just not sure, um, there are ways for you to get good information out there. Another option, and this is sometimes surprising to people, is just try Wikipedia. You know, Wikipedia got kind of a bad rap when it came out because it's, it is a crowdsourced encyclopedia, but it's partly because it's crowdsourced and partly because it's become so popular. Uh, it's a very good launching pad for getting some background information. If uh, the incorrect information is usually flagged uh, and what mostly why, why I like the site and, and feel comfortable putting it up here in a fact checking discussion is that it gives you the source uh, when, it, when it puts a piece of information out there it, uh, it will give you the source and then you can look at the source yourself. So Wikipedia, not a bad option. And then finally, uh, in the, not, not finally, not quite, um, <laughs> there's uh, just in the last uh, four months, uh, MediaWise, which is a, a program that has been helping to, uh, helping uh, develop um, curriculum for students and their teachers has branched out into the uh, world of older adults and is now offering um, a weekly online class uh, with Christiane Amanpour and Joan London uh, that will give you uh, your, you, you can take the class at your own pace and uh, 
you can do some weekly lessons on how to separate fact from fiction. So that's a new option and it's a good one if you wanna just hone your skills a little bit. And another option, I keep trying to bring these down from the hard complicated option to the easiest thing possible. Another really easy possible uh, fix uh, for a fake news-ish problem is to add an extension to your browser from a, a, an organization called NewsGuard which was started by uh, some very respected journalists and they have taken on the task of rating most of the news sites that pe people use to get online information. They've so far rated close to 6,000 of them and say that that is 95% of the online news organizations that's, that have um, the, where people get online news. And you can get the kind of ratings that we're used to, um, green, red, yellow, uh, and it, that's just a simple addition to your browser. They have some free options. So um, again, that's something you could look up if you were interested. Here's an example of a site that NewsGuard has rated as not reliable. So you would know just by when you went to the site, something would pop up on your browser giving you this warning. And that again, is just a simple <clears throat> way of cutting through some of the stuff that's out there. So now I'm just going to go through the common sense part of this. Um, and these tips, again, are not going to be foolproof. There's going to be stuff out there that you can't figure out without doing a fact check. But there are some very simple techniques that you can use. And the first of those is to avoid what's called clickbait. And clickbait is just what it sounds like. It's a story that pops up in your newsfeed or that maybe you see on the side of your Google results. Man tries to hug a wild lion. You won't believe what happens next. Well, the only way you can find out what happens next is to click. That's why it's clickbait. And if you have it in mind that these things that you're not really looking for that just pop up are aimed at drawing you in for some of the reasons we've already discussed, maybe you'll be less likely to click. Here's another one. I used to fall for these all the time. I love puzzles, but you know, this is not meant for me to do a puzzle. This is a way to keep me online and draw me in. So this kind of stuff, um, this is just a, another tool to have in your toolkit, right? You don't need to take the pop-up test. It's going to go down a rabbit hole. And uh, celebrities are another way to attract attention, to keep you online, to put up disinformation about celebrities and then keep you clicking is just another um, way that, uh, that we can be misled. So to summarize um, some of the takeaways, and again, I, I rely on my friends at the Stanford History Education Group. If you get a piece of information, you wanna think to yourself, who's behind it? And you can find that out either by doing your own fact check, by going to a trusted source, by researching the site. Um, you would not get that information by going to the About Us section of the webpage. You'll also want to think about what's the evidence. Why? What? What is the evidence that these teenage girls on Teen Vogue were ripping up the Constitution? If the only evidence is an image, and there's nothing else about that anywhere, that's a pretty good clue that this is an image you can't trust. You'll also want to think about what other sources say. You can bet that if Pope Francis had endorsed anybody, that would have been in every news source print. New, uh, cable and online all over the world. Uh, if it's just coming in your newsfeed, no place else, that's another sign to just be wary of what you're seeing. And just to show that you've got to be careful out there. In fact, when I read this quote, I thought it would be an excellent quote for my presentation, but it turns out if I go to Snopes, that it's not proven that Mark Twain ever actually even said it. So with that, uh, I'm going to stop and ask for your questions and have a discussion um, and see what we can learn from each other. We've got a couple of questions, uh, but uh, actually that last quote, so even if Mark Twain did not say it, is there evidence that it is in fact true that it is more difficult to convince people that you know, the, the, the fact checking is, is trying to go up, a, 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 is fighting an uphill battle, that it's, it's harder to, to un convince people they've been fooled than it is to fool people. 
Yeah, well, that's a that's a really interesting question. There were some there were some theories early on that if you just put up warnings about fake news, uh, and Facebook tried this, that you could you could flag a story and say that it was unproven or false. But that uh, the study showed that that um, but sometimes tended to, to make people disbelieve the fact check. So that sometimes they did not believe the fact check, and and other and, and the, it had the sort of contrary result of having people not believe stories that hadn't been checked by by fact check by by mm -hmm. Facebook. So it's uh, once a story that so that's one one answer to your question, and the other the other part of it is convincing people that they've been fooled after they've heard it a couple of times requires mm -hmm. you to overcome this truthiness effect. I don't usually quote Stephen Colbert, but I think I think he and he and Mark Twain or whoever said this are, are both right about that. We become convinced of things the more we hear them. Yeah, I mean, I've I've heard, you know, uh, arguments that that you know trying to um, uh, diffuse a, a misinformation often ends up reinforcing it because you're repeating it. Exactly. So that it's it's a really tough uh, tough battle. Right. So I have, I have a question. There's, still, there's some other good questions coming in from, from the audience, but I have a question. And that is, when you, you know, I was thinking back about uh, how, how we dealt with the issue of obesity, then, you know, the epidemic of obesity. You know, for a long time, we, we argued this was, this was an individual failing and that people really had to diet. They needed to act in healthy ways. They should exercise. And, you know, if they were overweight, they, they, were, they were not doing the right stuff. And then later on, we kind of figured out that it was a systemic problem that, you know, we had a society, you know, where empty calories were cheap and they were available. And, you know, the McDonald's of the world spends, you know, a huge amount of money to get you to crave, you know, burgers and fries. And that what we really needed is some kind of, you know, uh, regulations or policies to deal with it. So. I mean, it, it seems like a lot of what you're saying, and it certainly, to some degree, is our responsibility. But do you think, to what degree do you think this is a systemic problem that may require some kind of larger uh, intervention to address? Yeah, I, I, I love that question. Just for, for those of you who, I, my first career was as a lawyer, and, um, and so the legal aspects of this question uh, are quite interesting to me. The system, meaning the platforms that distribute this news, developed with the protection of something called the Communi Communications Decency Act of 1996. And, and that act, pre-Facebook, pre-Google, convey conveyed an immunity uh, from liability for content posted on these platforms. So Facebook it has not been challenged in court for information that's posted on its site uh, on the grounds that that information is not true and they don't they're not liable with some exceptions that I can get to uh, for that information but that has allowed these companies to develop in a way that no other company in the country can develop right with that with without being dragged into court all the time or if they are dragged into court they with again with very few exceptions, cases are thrown out, just dismissed under the Communications Decency Act. So that's one, um, one systemic issue that people are starting to look at now, whether that broad immunity should be cut back to limit the flow of misinformation. It has been cut back in the case of uh, human sex trafficking, and there are other efforts to chip away at it. There's a school of thought that the whole thing should be eliminated, uh, which would really change the dynamic of what was posted. Um, the other, uh, the other, I guess the other player, of course, that, that that's the government's role or what the government has or has not done. The platforms themselves are under a lot of pressure to control this feed now. I'm sure you've all been reading about uh, Twitter's battle with the president and, you know, what it's starting to be a little more traction and having things taken down. Uh, and there's a whole probably should not go there, but there's a whole battle, a, a, a theoretical battle over whether this, this, this love we have for the First Amendment, and I, I love it too, but it, there's a pretty strong argument that the First Amendment is a whole, is not the thing that's in play on Facebook because Facebook is not the government. So Facebook could restrict our speech without that being a violation of our First Amendment rights, but we have a very strong 
allegiance to the notion that anybody can say anything all the time. And that is deeply ingrained in our system. And that complicates all of these issues. Uh, Rose has a very practical question, which I think would be a good answer. And that is, how do we add nutrition labels? You were talking about, uh, you know, that that service where you could actually put the nutrition, add it as an extension to the browser. Can you just say how you, if somebody wanted to do that, how they would? What, what they I'm going to do um, is put in the chat the website, Great. and you can go there and uh, just download it. I, I, I'm they. It was free for a. Uh, a while, and now I think it might only be through, through uh, Microsoft, but it's a pretty user-friendly site, so. Okay, and we also have another question. Uh, somebody, there's a, a term called deep fakes, mm -hmm. and do you know what that is, and can you explain what deep fakes are? This is sort of a whole new frontier for <laughs> fake news. Yeah, well, that uh, deep fakes, I think, describes what happened with that Teen Vogue cover that I showed you, where the image has been manipulated. Um, and, and so you have part of the image is, is correct and part, uh, part of it is not. Uh, that's my understanding of the, the term. It's, it, it refers to the ability to, to for example, dub video. Right. There was a video that went out of, that had President Obama supposedly saying things that President Obama would not have said. Uh, and those, those are harder to catch because partly because it's visual and we we're, we're getting information that we tend to trust um there are some more uh uh so that that's one aspect of deep fakes manipulated video manipulated images another tool you can use and i remember richard you and i talking about this is something called a reverse image search um and again that's something you can google but it's it, essentially there's a way to take an image. Sometimes, sometimes you'll see a story and it'll have a picture of a hurricane blowing everything from one side of the town to the other. There was a story that went out and it turned out that that was from a hurricane five years earlier. So, so some of the, these images are, um, are a little hard. It's, a, it's, a, it's an actual image, but, it isn't, but the way it is being presented is falsely. Well, that's Not that's, what it's, that's one yeah. aspect of it, yeah. But or it's part of an image, but it's been right. doctored to add either a voice or a document. Susan, how much do we know about where this stuff comes from? What is? I mean, why is it that suddenly we? I mean, as you say, you know, this notion of fake news has been around for hundreds of years, but it seems like we're suddenly inundated with it. That it's become, in the last few years, just a much bigger problem. And yeah. so it's a sort of two-part question. What's changed so that we have so much more of it? And what do we know about where this comes from and what the motivations are for? Yeah, that, you know, for that, that's one where I wish we could have a round table and everybody could throw out their ideas. I and mean, we, know, we know a couple of things. We know this is a very small, small proportion, but for some of the health news, for example, some of that is the classic snake oil salesman, right? Um, you might get disinformation from vitamin companies. I have nothing against vitamin companies, but there are people who could make profit out of misinformation or mis misleading information. Um, but I think that is very small, but that's part of it. There are uh, people who want power, uh, who want to manipulate elections. And again, that's a motivation you can understand. Uh, as for the rest of it, I, I I think that's kind of the black, that's the big question and also the black hole, right? Uh, we are more polarized than ever. There are, um, there are every day, there are ways to disseminate this information by, um, by creating fake accounts and, and, and cre using artificial intelligence to disseminate it in ways that are ever more sophisticated. So there's the technological advances that make it possible. And then there's the, the psyche of the country issues, right? The polarization issues. And I think it's a combination of those. If I had the, if I had the answer to why, the, there's not one answer to why, but those are some of the factors that I think have given us this situation. I mean, I remember some years ago, there, there was stories about, there's a whole bunch of uh, just crazy stuff coming out in the political context. And it turned out it was like, teenagers in Macedonia who are making money from this. It was just because it is appealing, it's clickbait, uh, people are appealed to it. Um, they, were, they were making money from this. Right. It was just, it was a business. 
Yeah, I think I think that's true. I think the teenagers in Macedonia were um, a kind of early example of this, and we used to think of this as coming from outside of the U.S. Right. But I, I think the, the studies now are showing that it's coming from inside the U.S. and and that that is a just the, the best I can do is say that you know, the, the, this country is so deeply polarized that this kind of stuff is becoming another means of communicating. You know, there's always been fringe newsletters. Um, I might like to talk about my mother-in-law and the newsletter she would get. She was the only one who would get them. And now if you have a fringe theory, you can, you can get, and you get it picked up. Um, it, it can be out there and, and sent to everybody. And some people are, are passionate about their fringe, fringe theories. Uh, maybe one or two more questions. Somebody says, are fact check groups, this is from Peggy Peterson, are fact check groups a, a way to determine the funding sources for agencies and groups? In other words, you figure out where the, I mean, the way you figured out that it was the restaurants that were promoting the, you know, the campaign against the minimum wage. Sure, yeah. Um, so, well, a side answer to that first, the fact check groups will show you their funding. So that's always interesting itself, yeah. but, uh, yes, some of the time is the answer, right? It, the both all the sources I'm showing will give you their analysis, and part of that analysis, depending on the question, will tell you who funded a particular group. So oh. it's not true in all cases, but they will. It's not just go to the fact check and and have it say yes or no and then believe it. You can read how they got to that conclusion, which in, should include funding. Well, so the the message I'm taking away from this discussion is reader beware. Just, just read it with uh, with what somebody once called a crap detector turned on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that one, <laughs> you know, part of part of this whole discussion is is kind of a public awareness campaign, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't I don't know that everybody is going to walk away from this, and then every time they go online, go through a, you know, a fact check thing. But you might, if you walk away from this and you think, you know, I I'm not sure. I I, I haven't seen that from any other source. I'm not. I'm not going to buy into it. Then I think you know. I would. I would consider that a morning well spent. If that. Uh, if that was what some what people took away from this. Well, look, Susan, thank you very much for raising our awareness of this very important topic. And uh, let me turn it back to Ryan. Yeah, thank you again so much, Susan. Um, and please note, everyone, that we are recording this session. Um, and I don't know, we might be posting it in the future, um, but we can send out that information. I just want to thank everyone so much, again, for being able to attend. Um, and just thanks again so much, Susan, for this really important information um, and critical information. Um, and um, Actually, Susan, if you don't mind, maybe just mentioning those websites again, a couple of the websites that um, we can leave with our participants so that they know when they are online. Um, I think you had mentioned Snopes, factcheck.org. Um, were there any others that you might recommend just as we close? Yeah, I'm just going to put them in the chat. Okay, great. Yeah, she met, you mentioned MediaWise and Med. And PolitiFact. Right. Um, Oh, great. And so on that note, again, I just want to thank everyone so much for attending. I also would like to thank AARP California and Sophie Hori G. Forrester um, for not only being here today, but for their generous support to make sure that we could have done this session. And on that note, I'll leave the um, chat open just so that everyone can kind of, you know, take those notes um, again of just the websites. But again, just thank you so much. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. <laughs>